सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली The Adani controversy brings to our attention many related aspects of India's political economy. The first is the most important and immediate one: the opposition's allegation of cronyism, which, when elaborated, becomes a larger theme encompassing the top four or five leaders of corporate India. You can add Ambani to Adani's. You can add Ambani, Tata, Birla, and Vedanta to the list. All these qualify to be called conglomerates. they all have interests in diverse fields or aspirations in diverse fields this to be sure isn't a definitive or a comprehensive list there are many others but i have to limit it to some so i'm just conveniently limiting it to the top ones the tatas for example are often described as a salt to software conglomerate or group they produce automobiles and military aircraft run a massive and diverse airline business now and also make steel remember that old tagline we also make steel from tisco tata steel mukesh amani's reliance group spans a wide range of businesses too from refining to telecom as the main course to retail and even biosciences research and some media thrown in all in the desert trolley the aditya birla group has interest in metals aluminum in particular telecom cement yarns and more vedanta is still mostly into metals but is now on the energy radar also with its oil and gas production in rajasthan all these have three things in common one they are all legacy or at least family controlled enterprises reliance which is the ambani group and birla are empires founded by the previous generations vedanta and adani have first generation founders who control their businesses directly the extent to which members of the family in each case are in control of key businesses can vary from adani at one extreme to tata at the other two all of these have most of their businesses in areas where the government overhang is heavy and decisive where the government and the corporate interests intersect these are highly regulated areas and often especially in the case of adani monopolies by definition think mumbai airport and electricity distribution there what used to be done by bsas earlier that company the adani's bought so think mumbai airport and electricity distribution in the big metro or the mundra port or the mega plants with power purchase agreements the same applies to refining and telecom mining and oil field concessions a direct and extensive interaction with the state is critical to these businesses third and the most important for this week's discussion and which is our lament actually third and the most important for this week's discussion therefore is that none of them owns a truly global indian brand they will be protests from the tatas as i say so i understand because they have the taj hotels and now air india is back with them air india has been india's most familiar brand internationally i'd say with some humility though that taj is still not a hotel brand to all the world probably because they work in so many different categories from super luxury palaces to the very working class ginger and air india was killed by the sarkari case of death decades ago and it will now take some doing to bring it back to its old glory much of the criticism adani has faced in particular stems from his proximity to the modi government especially given how critical working with the state is for his main businesses if running ports on india's coast is a business fully regulated by the government buying port assets overseas is impossible without a supportive government whether that's a good thing or bad isn't the question in the polarized political debate it can often border on cronyism or can be seen as that the congress for example cites this as a case of the modi government running its foreign policy to quote unquote serve their friend adani's interest unquote 
Others might see it as important that any government work closely with powerful Indian conglomerates companies to compete overseas, especially with the rampant China with its Belt and Road Initiative and unlimited treasury. Similarly, think of the airports, highways, railways, tunnels, metros and much else that is being built in India right now, as The Economist noted in its latest issue. You will need companies that have deep pockets and large balance sheets to build so much infrastructure. Government can't do it. Would you leave it to Bechtels of the world to come and do it for you? Or would you rather have Indian conglomerates do it? Nobody can do it without working closely with the government. So that isn't the issue. The debate therefore has to be about whether there is a level playing field for all comers, the Bechtels included. This state corporate cooperation cooperation or nexus if you are conspiratorially minded didn't begin with the arrival of the Modi government. Many of the big licenses, contracts and even environmental clearances for the Adani group had come in the time of the UPA. Of course, the UPA will insist they did it fairly after asking the right questions, taking their time and giving all competitors an equal chance. This is politics. Everybody will make their claims. But the fact is, there are so many areas in a growing economy with such a hunger for infrastructure that private capital and the state will need to work together very closely. This, this is inevitable. We've discussed the Adani case in greater detail because it is the subject of most of today's debate. But all these conglomerates do most of their businesses in India and in areas where they can't escape the government shadow. Much of their revenue is domestic as well. There are exceptions for sure, like the Tata software business or, or maybe Reliance's product exports from their refinery. To understand this better, look at the case of Dhamra port on India's still poorly served eastern seaboard. The Tatas built it in the face of heavy odds, in particular opposition from environmental activists who had much greater say under the UPA dispensation. There were questions and litigation ranging from whether it was consuming reserved forest land to the feared destruction of the nesting sites of olive ridley turtles. By the way, you might have seen headlines just last week. I'll try and see if we can show you that on your screens that just last week stories came out that lakhs of them had come into nest just in that area on that coastline last week. The clearances did finally come in the UPA era for the Hamra port if after much delay, because despite, despite its devotion to environmental activism, its top leaders were too wise not to understand the vital need for another efficient port in the East. That the Tatas finally sold it to the Adanis is another story. While many would believe the insinuation that the Tatas must have been arm twisted into selling it to the Adanis, we need to think seriously whether India's oldest and most respected business house has become such a weakling now with no Maibap in the Modi government. Which brings us to the third and final point. The failure of these super powerful Indian corporations to build global brands is a real disappointment. We can classify brands broadly in three categories, country, company and product brands respectively. In the first category, India has some yoga, Ayurveda, spirituality maybe, engineering and maths talent, IITs and IIMs, generic pharma. You can add more to the list. Generic pharma means if you go across the world and if you ask people, do you know what is Cipla or what is Cadilla? They may not know. But if you do ask them about what India does with pharmaceuticals, they will tell you India makes cheap generic drugs, which helps us all. So that's a country brand, not a product brand. You can, of course, add more to the list. There are powerful Indian company brands known across the world, at least in business circles. Tata, Reliance, Vedanta and some companies within the conglomerates like TCS, for example. Then Infosys, Wipro, HCL and other tech companies, so many of them and now so many startups as well. None of them, however, has created a product brand that rules the world. India does not have a purely homemade car a two-wheeler, a software or operating system, not even a perfume or a beverage. We are collecting GI tags for scores of mostly agro products and yet not a brand that looks out from shop shelves globally. 
Corporate India has failed to create a garment brand, for example, and almost all that our factories produce and export is sold under the labels of international store chains, H&M, Marks & Spencer, Uniqlo, etc., etc. To that extent, our garment makers are also doing outsourced work, which is precisely what the Modi government is now promising in its larger manufacturing push with incentives like PLI and other concessions. While it is great that India is now making a lot of mobile phones for export, none of these carry an Indian brand name. The Chinese and the Koreans, on the other hand, have spawned a half dozen brands, if not more, that dominate global markets. The Modi government's manufacturing push is very good and necessary. But basically, it is pushing Indian manufacturing in the same direction as our software services industry, which is outsourcing. Cronyism is abhorrent and it is good that it is now being debated so robustly. But the much bigger failure of these incredibly powerful, imaginative, rich and successful companies, great, great entrepreneurs also, and of the state policy as well, lies in India's fully brand-free economic growth. And that is also something that we need to worry about while we debate and fight over cronyism, of course. But the much bigger failure of these incredibly powerful, entrepreneurial, rich and successful companies and of the state policy lies in India's fully brand-free economic growth. That is something also that we need to reflect on while we debate and fight the good fight over cronyism.